I'm Barry Gibson. Uh, I'm a medical sociologist and I work at the University of Sheffield in the unit of dental public health. Well, for many years, dentists um, have been basing their, uh, their views on, in science on um, the uh, clinical indicators, so looking at physical changes within the body. Uh, and it's only really since the uh, 1980s, the late 1980s, that uh, a group of people started to argue that really we should be listening to patients' uh, perspectives on the conditions that they're suffering. And so for that reason, uh, they developed a whole series of measures looking at the impact of different oral conditions uh, on patients within everyday life. And the reason why we should be interested in patient reported outcomes is that really we ought to understand oral health from the patient's perspective. Uh, after all, it is the patients that we're treating, not the kind of just the physical disease. Uh, we're looking at the person as a whole, a whole uh, thing, a whole entity. Uh, and one of the reasons why these measures are useful is because they help us understand the impact of conditions basically on the whole everyday life of the patient. The DHEQ is the Dentine Hypersensitivity Experience Questionnaire. Uh, it is a questionnaire that is designed to measure the impact of dentine hypersensitivity uh, on everyday life of patients. Uh, it has, uh, I think, around 48 questions. Uh, we, we have had several versions uh, and we've been gradually reducing it to, to a kind of a robust measure. And uh, it's basically a questionnaire that, that helps patients map uh, the range of impacts that uh, their dentine hypersensitivity has in their everyday life. Uh, it measures um, the frustrations that they have. Uh, it measures the impact on emotions. Uh, and it measures the impact on, uh, in terms of the amount of adaptations they have to make uh, in relation to uh, dentine hypersensitivity. So the dentine hypersensitivity questionnaire is, is really just a map of the everyday impact of the condition uh, on, on the patient's everyday life. The DHEQ was developed because um, there are actually uh, a whole uh, ream of uh, outcome measures, patient reported outcome measures in dentistry. So you have, for example, the Go High, you have uh, the OHIP, uh, the OIDP, uh, and all of those measures are generic measures. They're designed to measure the impact of oral conditions in everyday life. But one of the things about the DHEQ and the reason why we developed the DHEQ uh, was because when you look at the content of those measures, uh, they only have maybe, I think, uh, around seven items out of 49. Uh, that would actually show any kind of impact in relation to dentine hypersensitivity. So one of the first things we did when we were developing the dentine hypersensitivity questionnaire um, was basically to take those measures and look at them and say, are, are these questionnaires actually going to record the impacts of dentine hypersensitivity? And when you look at the actual items on the questionnaires, um, there is no way that they would be able to do that because half the questionnaire isn't really relevant to that condition. So this led us to actually think about uh, developing a questionnaire that was much more specific. Uh, I have to tell you at the time, we didn't think this would be a problem. We, we didn't realize that this was a problem actually. And uh, it was only after we took the time to go through those questionnaires to look at the existing measures that we began to realize that they wouldn't be able to show uh, any kind of sensitivity to change within the condition uh, simply because seven items out of 49, for example, on the OHIP is just not enough. It's just not going to robustly measure uh, the changing nature of the condition. Uh, so. That was why we had to develop the measure. Um, the existing measures just really weren't going to be able to provide a kind of robust measure of change over time. 
and uh, one of the key reasons why we needed the DHE coup was so that we could actually show change, measure change over time. Um, and so after having reviewed those measures, we basically went ahead and, and started to develop a new measure. The DHEQ, from the outset, when uh, GlaxoSmithKline got involved, uh, they approached us and they wanted us to uh, develop this measure. What we did was, um, uh, in the first interactions, we said, how serious are you about this? Uh, and uh, one of the things they said was, we're very serious. Um, so what we did was, we put together uh, several proposals. Uh, we put together a proposal that was looking at uh, a light version, sort of like an easy, easy to go, easy way of measuring. Uh, the second approach was to do a kind of gold standard uh, industry best kind of approach that if you were to do it this way you would have covered all the bases. Um, so the way in which we developed it uh, was very simple. We followed the kind of guidelines issued by Guyot, uh, Locker and Juniper and uh, we developed um, an approach that was in five stages. Um, so the first stage was to interview people about the condition uh, and uh, then to develop kind of questions from what they were saying. So, you know, you ask someone, well, how does, uh, how does this condition affect you? And people go, well, I can't eat ice cream anymore. And so you get a list of, you collate a, a huge list of items. Now, we actually went beyond the industry standard. And what we did was we, we took a theoretical model and we sought out items, seven items for each uh, different domain on, on the model. Now, initially, there was actually more than seven in each of the domains, uh, simply because we had to find out which ones work and which ones don't. So what you do is you get a, get a list, I think we had 56, I can't remember exactly, but we, we had well over 50 items initially. Um, and then we, uh, what you do is you give, give the questionnaire to a, a, a series of focus groups. So we got a bunch of people in, got them to read it, uh, looked to see if the questions made any sense. Uh, look to see if they agreed with the response format. Um, the response format is um, in the DHEQ is quite different to other quality of life measures. Uh, it's based on whether they agree or strongly disagree with the statement that is in front of them. Uh, so we gave it to the focus groups, uh, eliminated some of the questions that, that seemed problematic. Uh, and then in the third stage, uh, we did a kind of a pilot study, which is where you kind of chuck the questionnaire at 70 people and get them to fill it in, see whether or not uh, there are any major problems uh, in, in the way in which people are responding to the questionnaire. So some items, for example, they might have uh, everyone answering with the same response, in which case you've got an item that might not be particularly good. Uh, and then, so, so you take a look at that and then uh, eliminate more questions from, from that process. And then in the fourth step, we did a cross-sectional validation study, which is looking at the reliability and validity of the questionnaire. So does it measure what it's supposed to measure? Does it, uh, does it measure uh, the same thing? Uh, and uh, it was found to have quite good reliability and validity. Now, we published basically all of this, uh, the findings in the literature, so most of this can be readily downloaded and got hold of. Uh, and then the last stage, we did a longitudinal validation study, which was looking at it over time. Is it sensitive to change over time? Does it measure dentine hypersensitivity? Uh, as it varies uh, naturally in everyday life, uh, and is it reliable and valid again longitudinally? And uh, those were the five stages. Um, so the questionnaire was developed using a kind of industry standard kind of uh, approach within academia, uh, what we would call the gold standard sort of approach. And uh, we enhanced that by bringing theory into the process. So we, we, we went slightly further than most of the other academics that have been working uh, in this kind of field. And in addition to that, we, we are probably the first group to publish the qualitative findings. So that's the findings from the interviews. Uh, and then we published uh, the cross-sectional validation and the longitudinal validation. So all of, the, all of this uh, research can be easily got hold of in the literature if people want to read it. 
It's quite interesting. I think uh, from our perspective, uh, the development of the DHEQ has been uh, a real challenge uh, for us in, in the best possible sense. Um, when GSK initially came to us, they had a range of ideas. Um, they had some ideas about maybe doing some measurement of quality of life in, in other conditions. Um, and uh, we had initially thought that if we were to do anything, dentine hypersensitivity might not be the one that we'd want to do. And it's quite funny because it's interesting. As a condition, lots of clinicians and lots of people in dentistry downplay the importance of the condition. Um, and so therefore it is kind of seen as a kind of just an irritation really. It's just like something people have. Um, and we had that perception at the start, and to be really honest with you. Um, and it wasn't until we collected the qualitative data, we put together the, the proposal and we said, do you want, what kind of measure do you want? Do you want gold standard? And GSK went, yes. Uh, and then we uh, started to collect all of this qualitative data and we were amazed. We, we really did not expect to see the impacts that we saw, uh, the extent, the range, and uh, the kind of, uh, the, the degree of impact. To, to have someone sit for an hour and a half and tell you about their dentine hypersensitivity is, it was weird for us. We, we really honestly didn't anticipate it being quite as complex as it was either. So not only did they have a huge range and extent of impacts, it was extremely complicated. Um, and we found that the uh, way in which people were responding to the condition in everyday life uh, was uh, incredibly interesting. And then we, we discovered other stuff as we were going along. And, and what is very, very interesting is that GSK uh, were very, very keen on the measure and they were interested in developing the measure. And they also kind of funded this other kind of broader program of research as we went forward. GSK, uh, the team from GSK were involved in everything from the start. They, they, they were very much part of the team. Uh, it wasn't just uh, as a funder, we got them in and we were discussing data and we were discussing items that would go on the questionnaire. Uh, and I think in the middle of all of that, we realized just how much GSK have been listening to uh, people in relation to their dentine hypersensitivity because an awful lot of what we find I think they already knew. Um, but what we were doing was we were kind of producing it in a format uh, and according to the kind of protocols that uh, academic dentistry would expect. Um, so the involvement was very much um, from the outset stimulating the interest, um, really challenging us uh, and then uh, helping us kind of uh, move forward and I think they were very open to multidisciplinary approach that we adopted so we had sociology, psychology, we had dental public health, we had a team with a, a range of different skills and they were interested in listening to all of it. Um, so I think when I say that they, they really were responsible for, for actually making us think about something we had never considered uh, before and for us the big the big thing was that this condition actually has much more impact than we originally had invest, you know, envisaged ourselves. Uh, and so I think we've, we've come on a real journey. We've learned a lot about GSK in the process. The work we've done in the ZHEQ um, has produced loads of different surprises, actually quite a few. Uh, the first thing is um, that uh, the, the sheer complexity of dentine hypersensitivity, uh, for me, uh, as a sociologist looking at this as an oral condition, uh, to me, indicated that we have kind of underestimated the complexity of the mouth in everyday life. We have underestimated that the range of different oral conditions that affect people will affect them in quite different ways. And that... Uh, whilst it's important to have generic quality of life measures and generic oral health impact measures, uh, there may be quite a few conditions that have a range of other impacts that actually indicate the, the complexity of the mouth uh, and, and how the mouth plays an important role in our everyday lives. Um, so for me, the, the first big thing was to just really challenge what I had was a very kind of simplistic idea 
coming from, you know, having read uh, the OHIP, the OIDP, Go High, which to me are the, go- the main measures in, in oral health uh, related impacts. And uh, to have come from an environment where I felt that those were really the gold standard, there really wasn't any need for anything else to suddenly beginning to see that the mouth is much more complex than perhaps uh, I had envisaged. Um, So dentine hypersensitivity and looking at it and looking at its impact and and the difference that it and the challenges it presents to people in everyday life really helped me move beyond uh, a kind of very narrow view of of the impact of of the mouth in everyday life. The second thing I think that was really significant about um, this was that really peculiar thing happened when we were doing the interviews. So we interviewed all these people, and as I said uh, in earlier when I was talking, um, the uh, patients could talk for up to an hour and a half. So they would be telling us about, you know, like um, some very weird things, you know, like. I have to microwave my ice cream. Uh, I have to kind of wait for 50 minutes uh, before uh, I can eat cheesecake. Uh, And kind of really odd behaviours that they were having to do, strange adaptations in order to avoid the sensitivity that they were experiencing. And then almost to a person at the end of the interview, they would go, ah, but it's not a big problem. It's just nothing. It's no big deal. And... We got very curious about that. As a sociologist, to me, that tells me something very strange is going on uh, because you can't have someone talk for an hour and a half about impact and then just go, but it's not important. Uh, So what we did was we, we became very curious about where that might come from. And why is it that there, there is a, what I would call a socially conditioned response to the condition? And uh, I'm not going to go into the complexity of it, but GSK, in a way, have stimulated us to go and look at the concept of dentine hypersensitivity. And uh, we recently published a paper looking at the the, the concept over the last 180 years. Um, and what we discovered was that dentine hypersensitivity as a concept is is kind of considered in a kind of very derogatory manner in some respects in in dentistry. Dentists often don't hold conversations with patients about dentine hypersensitivity. So one of the things that will happen is the patient will tell you, they go to the dentist uh, and they say, I've got sensitive teeth. And the dentist will go, oh, use Sensodyne or use uh, whatever product um, that that comes into their mind. And that's the end of the conversation. Um, And so historically, the truth is that patients have been conditioned into not bothering their dentist with this condition. And the reason for that is because dentine sensitivity is what dentists are interested in. Because dentine sensitivity is sensitivity that occurs as a result of disease. And of course, the dentist is there to prevent disease, real disease, in the form of caries, holes in teeth, and and things that can lead to the rotting of teeth, teeth falling out. Uh, And dentine hypersensitivity uh, historically developed just as a bit of a nuisance. Uh, on the outside of the interests of the dentist. Um, So we published this research, and this is one of the the big things about getting involved with the DHEQ. We we ended up with all sorts of other findings that just we hadn't really anticipated. Historically, the definition of dentine hypersensitivity as a short, sharp pain arising from exposed dentine uh, was first proposed in, I think, 1983. Uh, And that definition uh, only developed uh, in the literature uh, because before that time, the condition was basically a kind of strange enigma. Uh, that dentists kind of got these weird patients that would come in and complain of sensitivity that, and there was no disease and, and they were kind of odd and things. And, and so, so it became a kind of condition that people talked about, but, but there was no clinical definition. So what happened was uh, the definition uh, proposes that dentine hypersensitivity is a sharp, sharp pain from exposed dentine that is the result of no other pathology or no other cause. So it's, it's a definition of exclusion, as it were. 
Um, and that definition has only really become established later when uh, the Canadian Association adopted it, as it were, in a consensus kind of definition. Um, now, those definitions are as a result of the clinical worldview. So the clinician looking in, looking at the mouth, looks for pathology, looks for uh, kind of exposed dentine and then describing the structure of the teeth comes out with a kind of a definition uh, of something from his or her perspective. Um, but the DHEQ uh, actually maps the experience of that hypersensitivity and produces a measure of that. And it has a number of different domains. So it tells us about First of all, for example, the number of adaptations people have to make in relation to their hypersensitivity, you know, so for example, I can't eat ice cream uh, and, and the different problems that they're experiencing that they have to change. Uh, the next thing it tells us about is it, it produces an indicator of the emotional impact of dentine hypersensitivity, the frustration, the annoyance uh, that the condition produces for, for people in everyday life. Uh, the uh, measure uh, also looks at the uh, way in which dentine hypersensitivity impacts on someone's social life. Uh, and so therefore, really what we're talking about is a, a composite indicator of the impact rather than it just being either present or not, which is what the definition says. What we have is, is a kind of an, a complex indicator that can provide a very sensitive uh, in, uh, measure of the range of different impacts that someone experiences uh, in their everyday life as a result of dentine hypersensitivity. So what it does is it deepens our understanding, it pr promotes a, a depth of meaning to the condition from the patient's perspective that we really haven't had up until now.